Today we're starting a two-week series called We're All Family, and this morning we're going to be talking about the blended family. The blended family. So a simple definition of the blended family is this. It is a family unit where one or both parents have children from a previous relationship, but they have combined to form a new family. Now, they'll be called step families or step parents. There's other names out there. So I wanted to make sure at least I could give you a definition, a working definition, so that you would understand what we're talking about this morning. And according to the bonded family, almost 2,100, 2,100 blended families form in the United States every day. Did that hit you the way it hit me when I first read that? If, in fact, you know, it hit me and it was such a wow that I wanted to go back and, and, and make sure that the number was correct. And everything that I studied, everything that I looked at said that it is absolutely correct. And so what that means is, is that there's a lot of brokenness in our families. There's a lot of brokenness in, in, in non-Christian families. There's a lot of brokenness in Christian families, the divorce rate among Christian families is as high as it is among non-Christians. Can you believe that? It's the, it's the truth. So there's a lot of brokenness in our families. And Business Innovators Magazine predicts that the blended family will become the predominant family structure in the U.S. Wow. Boy, no, no more days of Ozzy and Harriet, right? No, no, no more days of... You know, those particular stereotypical type of, of sitcoms that portrayed, you know, the, the, the perfect husband, the perfect wife, the perfect children, the perfect mom and dad. It seems like those days are pretty much over. And according to the Total Life Counseling Center, that's mainly due to the fact that over 50% of first marriages fail. And yeah, you heard me right a few minutes ago, which has always really bothered me. What are we doing wrong as a church? But even among Christian families, the divorce rate is over 50%, and 75% of second marriages fail. So if you've just gotten married for the second time, aren't you pumped up? <laughs> probably not. You probably wish you'd maybe missed this message. According to the Rebuilding Families website, over 1 million children will experience the divorce of their parents each year. That's a staggering thought. It's a staggering number. It's a staggering thought. And 65% of those children will end up in a blended family due to the remarriage of one or both biological parents. So as you can imagine, as you can imagine, the blended family, it, 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 there's a lot of brokenness and there's a lot of pain and there's a lot of grief. It's been said that blended families don't have a family tree. It's been said that they have a family forest. And that's true. Now, I did hear uh, of a lady that I talked to after the service that was telling me about a situation where there was a divorce and um, there was a remarriage. And she said, you know what? But this little girl, this little 12-year-old girl is now surrounded by a multitude of people that love her and are encouraging her. So I'm just saying things can, things can work for the good. One writer said this, blended families inherently mean something went wrong. Divorce. But it's not just divorce. There's death. There's the searching. There's health issues. There's accidents. There's neglect. There's substance use. And there is abuse. According to World Village, children who live in a blended family are three times more likely to need psychological counseling or psychiatric care than other children. And they're also 50% more likely to develop health problems than children living with both biological parents. Now, aren't you excited you came today? I mean, aren't you tired of this doom and gloom? Come on. Aren't you tired of it? Don't you, don't you want to hear some good news? Don't you want to hear that there's actually hope for all of us? Whether you're a biological family, whether you are a blended family, there's wonderful things that God can do if, if... We're willing to overcome the barriers to marital imp, uh, intimacy, and that is whether it is a biological family or a blended family. Are y'all with me? Y'all out there? Intimacy. Come on. Somebody had to wake up. Is he going to talk about 
Starts with an S. Thank you. <laughs> you, knew, you knew I was counting on somebody saying that, right? And if they understand a blended family's challenges and dynamics. A great resource according to Focus on the Family. And for those of you that don't know, Focus on the Family has been around like 150 years. Um, I think they actually got here before the Mayflower. I'm just kidding. But fam- Focus on the Family has been around a long time. For those of you that are followers of Jesus and have been in church, you've heard that name for a very, very long time. And according to them, a great resource is the Smart Step Family, family by Ron L. Dean. And old Ron L. gets uh, high marks from notable Christian experts, says Dennis Rainey. For those of you that are familiar, again, maybe you're readers and you've checked out some Christian counseling stuff. And H. Norman Wright uh, as well. And he, Ron says that there are five things that you can do to limit the influence of your past experience and marriage from impacting the negativity of your present marriage. Here they are, five things that you can do. Are you ready? Here's the first one. Identify your ghost. You know what? I was so excited about getting to this point because I thought, quite honestly, that I would lose some of you in the whole intro part. And so the intro part, I like jumped in, like right off, you know, into the blended family thing, gave you a lot of stats. And some of you are thinking, you know what? This stuff's not, it's not going to apply to me at all because I'm not a part of a blended family. I'm a, I'm, I have our biological family. I, it's, it's my wife. It's our kids. And so we're just living happy and we're doing well. Maybe you walked in as a single person and you thought, wow, so like the next two weeks I can totally avoid. I don't have to, I don't have to come. Like next week I'm going to be talking about parenting. And here's the title of the message for next week. Burden or blessing? (laughs) You don't want to miss next week. I'm just saying. So if you're single, here, listen, if you're single, here's the thing that I thought was awesome about all, everything that I'm going to share with you this morning, and that is this, is that it doesn't matter whether you're married or not, whether you're remarried or not, or whether you're single and never been married, we all are in relationships, are we not? Absolutely. And so maybe you, you, know, you have a friend, maybe there's somebody that you're dating, maybe it's a neighbor, maybe it's somebody that you work with, but we are all struggling through relationships, and the things that we're going to talk about today are going to apply to you just as much as it will to anyone who's in a blended family. So here's the first one. Identify your ghost. What pain or baggage are you especially sensitive to? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Sounds like a 12-step study to me. Y'all knew that was coming somewhere, right? You knew I was going to plug CR, I was going to plug recovery, because we're all in recovery. One of the things that I noticed early on in, in our marriage was that there would be certain things that Karen could say that would like set me off. Now, of course, y'all know I'm a very meek, mild-mannered, never struggled with anger in my life kind of guy. But she could say certain things. And one of the things that she would say early on in our marriage, and it was true, it was absolutely 100% true, but every time she said it, it sent me up a flagpole. She'd say, well, baby, we can't afford it. And I would just get fighting mad. And so I finally I said, you know what? You, I don't know. I, I know we can't afford it. But it took me all the way back to my childhood, and it took me back to feelings that I had then. And what I understood was that if I don't deal with this past ghost, if I don't identify that, then I'm going to struggle in our marriage with it as well. Y'all with me? Number two, identify your fear triggers. Identify your fear triggers. It could be a behavior. It could be a gesture. It could be a tone of voice. It's not what you said. It's y'all could have wrote this message. Um, It's a verbal message of your spouse that kind of sets you off. It it might be a feeling that you experience that just reminds you of your painful past. Be sure that you know what sets you off so that you will know how to interrupt the trigger. It goes back to my ghost. It goes back to learning how that, for for us, learning how as as a couple to communicate, learning that there are certain things that she would be sensitive of. There would be a trigger for her. There would be triggers for me. And we learned To not say those things in the sweet name of Jesus. Number three, I think this is just awesome. Interpret the present in light of the present, not the past. I was in a lot of meetings this week, and and I was in a meeting with a lot of staff this week. And and, um, 
it was, it was such a sweet moment as one staff person. I don't even know how this came up. I mean, it's like out of the blue. One staff person looked at another staff person and said, you know what, i got to be honest with you. I, I really ha- have judged you based on someone that is similar position in my past. And that person in my past acted like you act. But they were hypocritical. In other words, they, they might come across as though that they're a compassionate, caring, loving pastor, but they weren't. But what I've discovered is that you were actually, you're actually real and genuine, and that is you. Wow. How easy is it for me, because I've done it, to interpret the present in light of my past, rather than giving someone in the present the benefit of the doubt. Number four, wrestle with forgiveness. Did I not say this is going to just apply to every relationship? It doesn't really matter. Wrestle with forgiveness. Some ghosts persist because you haven't fully grieved the past or forgiven your ex-spouse or your ex-mother-in-law or your ex-father-in-law or whatever the case might be. Forgiveness is huge, is it not? And let me just say this, not in my notes, just as free. I don't even think I said it in the first service. Let me tell you what forgiveness is not. It's not looking at someone and saying, I forgive you. That's not it. Let me tell you what it's not as well. Neither is it a one-time thing, boom, I did it, I'm over it, I walk away from it, it's done. Let me tell you what, you may struggle with forgiveness over a long period of time, and you may feel like that you've walked away from that emotion only to wake up six months later and it's staring you in the face again. And so forgiveness is something that we have to make a conscious decision that we're going to participate in and pursue every day of our lives. Unforgiveness is like drinking rat poison, hoping it kills the other person. Y'all with me? Unforgiveness will do more to harm you than it ever will to harm anyone else. Number five, ask your current spouse for prayer. Share what you're learning about, about yourself. I, I do this with Karen often. I remember having an experience on the, on the beach um, a, a few months ago, and, and I remember coming back and sharing with Karen, and it was just God thing. And I'll probably share this with y'all in a few weeks. I, I think, at least I think I've already put that in a message, but... It was this incredible experience I had with, with God. And I came back and I said, let me just tell you what I learned about myself. What God just taught me about myself. Share that with the people that you love so that they'll understand you. Know where you're coming from. Now, what can you do to work successfully in blending two families into one? How do you, what kind of steps can you take? First thing you have to do, I think this is super important, and this is my humble opinion anyway, you got to clarify expectations. Clarify expectations. Proverbs chapter 3 says this, Blessed are those who find wisdom, those who gain understanding. For she is more profitable than silver and yields more returns than gold. She is more precious than rubies. Nothing you desire can compare with her. I think it's just wise to have clear and reasonable unex- uh, expectations. I think it's unreasonable to think that blended family members are going to feel right out of the gate and relate to each other right out of the gate like a biological family. I think that's what we want. I think that's what we desire. I think that that's what we aim for. I think that that's what we try to push. And when that doesn't happen, I think that we're offended. I think it's unreasonable to believe that as a brand-new step-parent, that suddenly you can step in and replace another, uh, the biological parent. There's, there's brokenness and there's hurt. Now, can it happen? Absolutely. But it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. So set realistic expectations for your marriage and for your family. I think it's unreasonable. Um, it's unrealistic to think that a step-parent can take the place of a biological parent. I just said that. And I say that, and you know what? I want to argue with myself. Some of you should want to argue with me. Because it's a complicated statement. I've actually known step-parents, quite honestly, that were better parents than the biological parent. I just heard some, oh. But it's true, isn't it? So in the perfect world that we live in with, with uh, substance abuse, with addiction being what addiction is, and we're all, don't, don't kid nobody. Don't look around thinking, I wonder who's addicted to what. 
We're all addicted to something. We're all addicted to something. We all got our junk. Maybe yours is sugar. Granulated, not lipilated. And some of you may be addicted to the lipilated too. Did y'all even pick up on that? That's my addiction. I tried to get some sugar from my wife while ago, and she wouldn't give me no sugar. She said we were in church. She wouldn't give me no sugar. I've seen what drugs and addiction and brokenness can do. And I've seen biological parents that struggle to reconnect with a child that's been left broken. However, a step-parent can build trust and develop a loving relationship with time and effort. And while you cannot expect and you certainly should not demand, what you can do is you can show and should expect respect. You can't demand that you're going to take the place of a biological parent. You can't do that. Even, even if there's been death, you can't, you can't do that. But what you can and should expect is respect. Teaching a child to respect another person is just a great life principle. I mean, I just wonder what our world, how different would our world be if we could just learn to respect each other. And I'm blaming Facebook. How about you? Everything that's wrong with our culture, it's got to be Facebook. Don't you think so? It couldn't be us. It couldn't, like, be the church, right? What would happen if we begin to respect one another? And let me just say this. Respect, as I understand it, is much more caught than it is taught. I'm just saying that as you love and respect your children, as you love and respect those exes, as you love and respect those other folks that are in their lives, you know what? You'll teach them how to love and respect. Doesn't mean that you agree with. You don't have to agree with. But respect is something that you can give someone even if you disagree with that person. I love Deuteronomy 11, verse 19. It says, teach them to your children. Teach these precepts, these concepts. Teach the law of God to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So I want to give you a few quick tips for clarifying expectations. You ready? Here we go. Number one, talk. Number two, talk. Number three, talk. Number four, talk. Number five, see, I knew you guys were sharp. Talk. Talk as much as you possibly can. Talk in the car. Talk over a meal. To have family meetings and talk. Have fun and talk. Some of the best conversations that I've had with my kids is when we're having fun and we're talking. Believe it or not, sometimes it's when we're having fun that I have the opportunity to teach my, to teach my children some things about Jesus that the, maybe they didn't know. It's awesome. Spend time together and talk. Just sit and talk. Communication is huge. Mourn the losses. This is tough. I think it's really tough for newly married couples in a blended family. Ecclesiastes 3 says this, there's a time for everything, a time to cry, a time to laugh, a time to grieve, and a time to dance. If you've been to a funeral that I've had the privilege of doing over the last few years, honestly, right out of the gate, this is one of the things I start with. And it seems like somehow in the church we weren't really taught well to grieve. Uh, we were taught to be strong, be strong for, uh, be strong for your children. I've got to be strong for my spouse. I've got to be strong. I've got to be strong. I've got to be strong. In fact, it's probably not likely, at least when I, the churches that I grew up in, that I would have ever dared to say. In fact, my dad passed away when I was 10 years old, and no one asked me how I was doing. Because strong Christians, great Christians don't grieve. That is a lie. Of course you grieve. Loss hurts. The best thing that you can do, the best thing that we can do for our children is to grieve the loss of a relationship. It's to grieve. Teach them how to grieve. I'm a pastor. I, I, I came to the realization not too very long ago that, you know what? I've got a master's degree. I know you're shocked. 
I've been to school. I know, again, you're shocked. They don't claim me, you, just so you know. They don't claim me. I've got a diploma, diploma that says, yes, sir, I went there. But no one ever taught me how to grieve. Learning how to sit in grief. I didn't know how to sit and grieve. I just tried to stay busy. That's not grieving. One of the things I've learned is that a couple starting a new relationship may not necessarily want to grieve. You, you, you don't want to grieve, right? I mean, you want to celebrate a new start, a new relationship, a second chance on love. Man, look, you're excited. And so what you want to do is you see the brokenness maybe in your child or, or maybe in his or her child. And you see that and you see the brokenness. And what you want to do is you want to make everything okay. And you want to make everything okay today. And so what you want to do, and sometimes I think that we're, uh, what I've experienced is that parents can, the step-parent can be a little bit offended. How come you're not on board with me now? This is great. We're going to have fun. This is going to be a wonderful, beautiful family. What I've experienced in my life is that ch children who come from some of the most incredible circumstances that you can imagine, circumstances that you would think that child would want to flee from, they still grieve the loss of a biological parent. Let them grieve. Allow them to grieve. Teach them to grieve. Teach them it's part of life. Teach, teach them it's normal. Teach, teach them that it's, it's healthy to grieve. And then I think you need to teach them this. This is super, super important. I heard this growing up when I was, a, when I was young, is that time will heal. If I've learned anything, time will not heal. Time will make you cold and mean and bitter. That's what time will do. It is the Holy Spirit of God that heals. And so what you have the opportunity to do is to sit down with the child and to say, this is tough. And here's the thing. You can't do this on your own. You weren't made to do this on your own. You weren't wild to, uh, you, you weren't made to do this on your own. You weren't created to do this on your own. You have the Holy Spirit of God. Let, let Holy Spirit bring healing to the brokenness in your life. It's a wonderful opportunity to teach. Job 8.21 says this, He will once again fill your mouth with laughter. He will once again. Maybe not now, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow. But He will once again fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Third, focus on strengthening the marriage. If experience has taught me anything, it's that oftentimes a parent will, maybe out of guilt or shame, try to make up for the loss. And you know what? You put all the focus on the child. Maybe you feel responsible. Maybe if you don't feel responsible, maybe you're not responsible for what created or caused the situation that you're in. But they're your child, and so you want to fix it, and you want to fix it today. And so you want to rush in, and you, and you want to make them the priority. Then you're setting yourself up for failure. I, I read this somewhere. I, I wish I could remember where I read it, and I'd give them credit for it, or maybe the blame. Maybe it's a better word. But here's what I read. Since the weakest link in the blended family is the marriage relationship, invest deeply into the life of your new spouse. Share spiritually together. Talk about your walk together. I love it when Karen comes to me and she's learned something new. And so it's so cool because she'll come to me, I think it was this morning and maybe, and she said, you know, I, I thought I'd talk to you, and you probably already knew this. And I went, no, never heard it. A few weeks ago, she did the same thing. And once again, the spiritual giant that I am, I said, nope, I never heard it. It's sharing together. It's growing together. I hope that makes sense. And as you strengthen your marriage, you'll strengthen the family. Next, you got to work on conflict resolution. I just don't know how good we are at that. We have a staff person, Renee Lynn. I think Renee, like she ought to teach classes on conflict resolution. She is the smoothest talker. I'm not kidding. Yeah. That didn't really come out right, did it? It certainly sounded like that was. She's awesome. I've seen Renee in so many situations where Renee can actually begin to bring peace and bring a calmness to a volatile situation. Matthew 18 says this, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their sin. I like the part where you point out their sin. That's not exactly 
the thrust of that passage. Point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that in every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I'm just saying deal with your junk. Listen, all families, all families have conflict. All families have conflict. Well, Karen and I don't, but m- all the rest of you have conflict. I learned a long time ago, I'm wrong. <laughs> I think I'll go over here, <laughs> chat with y'all for just a minute. Uh, all families have conflict. Learn to deal with your stuff. Learn to deal with your stuff. Six, practice love. Practice love and forgiveness. John 13. um, This is a simple verse. But it contains so much more truth and power than you could imagine. I think sometimes we quote verses without sitting in the verse. Y'all know what I'm talking about? To just sit in it. So John 13, it's a powerful verse. A new commandment I give you. Love one another. There you go. Love one another as, as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. Let love direct your behavior. In, in church, I think... That what I've learned over the years, because of Spring Well, the nature of what we do, and people that walk through the door, and we love everybody that walks through the door. I mean, we really do. The doors are open to this church, are open to anybody and everybody. But I think that's confused people over the years. They say, well, but whoa, 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 whoa now. So if you love these people, but like if you put your arms around them, and you love them, and you put your, you know, you pat them on the back, and th- then they're going to think that you're condoning their sin. You're going to think, they're going to think that you're telling them that they're okay. Who told you that? Now, you've got to go back to honest conversation, and that's what we have the opportunity to do is we have had honest conversations with people over the years. But honest conversations doesn't mean that you draw a line if they don't agree with you. I believe that, I, I believe that my youngest daughter is in church today because of love. The power of love. The power of consistently loving. Parents used to ask me. They knew that Katie had too much of my blood and she was doing some stuff that that she shouldn't have done. And so they would say, well, but what do you tell her? I'm like, every time you're with her, do you peel out, peel out the Bible? No, I don't. But see, we, we tried really hard on the front end to teach solid biblical principles. And so I didn't have to beat her over the head with the Bible. She knew where we stood. But love. Saying, baby, no matter where you go in this world, one thing you can count on is your mom and dad's love. The power of love in a simple verse that says so much. Our job as parents is to show children the love of Jesus by our actions. We draw them to Jesus by not quoting a bunch of scripture. We, we, we love them to Jesus. We show them Jesus through our actions. I think it's powerful. Practice forgiveness. That's a part of love. Uh, there's going to be occasions when you have to learn to forgive your children. Your stepchildren. Or your spouse. Or your in-laws and your outlaws. Learn how to love well. And last... Um, so I had more points today, and I think I've had, had the message maybe in my entire life. Next week, the message is pointless. <laughs> that didn't come out right, did it? Next week, we'll just find a passage and hang out in it. Today, we're a lot of points. I wanted to give you some tools to help you. Here's the last one, and I took... I laughed at myself. I looked and I said, well, these are two points, really, rolled up into one. And I did it because I already had so many points. I know. Anyway, I'm sick. So build a strong relationship with God and other believers. Powerful. 
That, that's powerful. As followers of Jesus, we have at least two things that people who don't follow Jesus don't have. Two things. First, you know what we have they don't have? We have the Holy Spirit. They don't have the Holy Spirit. So if you want to talk about the difference between a follower of Jesus, a Christian, and a non-Christian, you want to talk about the difference, the main difference, it's not always our actions. Come on, church. Let's quit being hypocritical. Let's raise our hands and say, you know what? I'm as messed up as you. But I'll tell you what we do have. We do have something they don't have. We have the Holy Spirit. Beautiful verse in John 14. It says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you. And you know what? It says, he will be with you forever. Have mercy. Relationships are hard. They just are. If it's somebody you work with, if it's somebody you go to school with, if it's somebody you live beside, if it's a friend, if it's a girlfriend, if it's a boyfriend, it doesn't matter. Relationships are hard. And I'm going to tell you what I need. I need Holy Spirit in my life. I need Him whispering in my ear and telling me when I'm wrong. And saying, boy, you got a little pride here. You, you, you need to suck that up. You need to have a conversation need to talk you need to work it out the second thing that followers of Jesus can have can have is community wow beauty and the wonder of community when it's done well Galatians 6 verse 2 gosh it's one of my favorite verses carry each other's burdens carry them so when mine's too heavy, I've got some great brothers that'll surround me. Text me, how you doing? You okay? Everything all right? What can I do for you? Hey, you want you want you want to grab a coffee? You want to have you want to have lunch? Most of my guys like to eat, so you want to have lunch? Um, what, what? How can I help carry the burden that you're under? So you need the support of others who will listen non-judgmentally, accept you unconditionally, and talk with you truthfully. I want friends that are not afraid to speak truth into my life, even when that truth goes against the grain for me. I, I, need, I, I had a, a brother not too many months ago that just looked at me and said, I said, I, you know, I think this, I think that. And he said, no, it's not true. Yes, it is. I said, how do you know? You know what he said? He said, it's the look on your face. It's the sound of your voice. There's hurt. There's brokenness. I said, you're right. So you have to find the support of other Christians who are going through what you're going through. So if you're in a blended family, I just, how are you doing? Are you following biblical principles? Are you listening to more to outside influencers? Are you, are you taking scripture and saying, you know what, this is hard, but we've got to apply this. I've got to learn to forgive. I've got to love. I've got to... I mean, we got to have clear expectations. Have you, have you started to work through these principles that I just believe work? They work in all relationships. How are you doing? And if you would say, you know what, we're struggling. We're struggling. Then I want to pray for you. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed. No one's looking around. So if you would say, you know what? Maybe it's a biological family. You don't have to be in a blended family because we all got problems. There's a conflict in every relationship from time to time. If you're here this morning, you would say, you know what, I just need some prayer. As I try to navigate these relationships, would you just slip up your hand? Awesome, thank you. Lord, You've seen honest people slip up their hands to acknowledge the struggle. Lord, we confess to you this morning that we're weak, but you are strong. 
Lord, I pray that somehow you can take these words, these things that I've shared this morning and breathe hope. Lord, the tools that somebody could put in their tool bag and, and pull that tool out on those days when they're desperate. And Lord, a tool is no good unless it's in the hands of Holy Spirit. So Father, for these people that just acknowledge that they're struggling, Holy Spirit, would you be so incredibly real to them, draw them close, love them, teach them. Father, we'll thank you for what you do to heal them, the hurt, uh, the brokenness, the grief. We'll put that in your hands. Every head still bowed, every eye still closed. Maybe you're here this morning, you're not a follower of Jesus. And you know what? Maybe you listen to this message and maybe your thought was, wow, so God cares like about my relationships? Absolutely. What I want you to know is God's crazy about you. He's absolutely crazy about you. What he wants more than anything in this world, it's not what you're going to do for him. He just wants a relationship with you. That's all he wants. So if you're not a follower of Jesus and you'd like to be, then maybe you would pray a prayer, something like this. Just quietly, right there in your seat. Maybe you would just say, Lord, sweet Jesus, I'm broken. I'm broken by my own sin. And I need you. I need you and I want you in my life. So I'm just going to ask that you forgive me of all my sin. I'm telling you this morning that I've come to the end of myself. I don't want to do this alone anymore. I don't want to be in the driver's seat anymore. I want you to be the master and the Lord of my life. And from this day forward to the best of my ability, I will follow you. Father, you're awesome. Thank you for just you being you. So, Lord, thank you for, this will sound kind of weird, I guess, but thank you, Lord, for walking me through today. Um, thank you for your love. Thank you for your power. Thank you, Lord, that I have a testimony that you have absolutely never left me alone. Thank you for your incredible presence, your love showing up in the most amazing ways in my life. I love you. It's in your name we pray.